Perfect. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I am very excited tonight with us. We have Tish Hevel. Um, she is, uh, work, she works with the Brain Donor Project, which is really fascinating. And honestly, um, at Bobby Jones CSF, we get a lot of questions every once in a while, honestly, about how people can donate their, um, their brains and their nerves and all of the things that kind of tie into Chiari Stringomyelia. Um, after they pass to see if they can advance the science, which is really, really awesome. And I never know what to say, so I'm really glad to have met Tish Hevel at one of the nonprofit forums at the NINDS. Um, and so what I'm going to do, just so you kind of get the gist, I'm going to ask you to really introduce yourself a little bit, um, kind of how you got involved in all this, and I don't know if that's part of your presentation. So I if you just want to do your presentation as well, that's fine. I'm going to pop off while you do your presentation, and then I will come back on at the end when we have the question and answer section. Um, and so I think with that, I'm going to kind of stop talking and running my mouth and allow you to do your presentation. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make you a presenter right now. Oh, Great. wait, I think you are. Try am sharing. I? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I can. OK. I talk for a quick second and then go into the slides. Caitlin, thank you so much. I got to tell you, I'm thrilled to learn that you get a lot of questions about brain donation um, because a lot of people, um, you know, are starting to hear more and more about it. And I'm always amazed and impressed at how many people are interested in doing it because it's such a generous thought to you know, give something of yourself when you're finished using it so that you might be able to spare future families the same sort of pain maybe that you went through. So as um, as Caitlin said, my name is Tish Hevel and I am the founder and CEO of the Brain Donor Project. So I will go ahead and walk you through this presentation then I'm happy to take um, any questions that you all have about this. So sharing my screen real fast here. Um, so hopefully you can see this. Um, I'm going to move it down just a hair so I can put it into presenter mode. There. Um, I'm assuming you all can see this. It's just a like a flat screen that says the Brain Donor Project on the left-hand side. And so my first thing here is I want to thank you all so much for having me here today to talk about what really has become an urgent situation in medical research. Um, it's urgent for a couple of reasons. Finding answers about brain disease in general has become um, urgent in more ways than I can even tell you. For starters, one in five of us already has some kind of neurologic disease or disorder. And if you think about it, that's someone in everybody's circle, um, whether it's a, a dementia or a neurodegenerative disease or a serious mental illness or malformations that you guys know too much about. Um, it's 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 an issue, and we're not getting the answers fast enough. And when you couple that with the fact that it's going to get worse, that our chances of being diagnosed with a neurologic disorder increase as we age and we're living longer than ever, it's very easy to see where this is heading because the burden will be tremendous. Um, many scientific investigators say that that makes donated human brain tissue um, perhaps the most precious resource known to science, whether or not you have a neurologic disorder. You heard that right. But the problem is not enough people know about it. Or they have major misconceptions about brain donation. So, for example, um, the biggest one is that if you have checked the box to become an organ donator, an organ donator, an organ donor, it includes brain donation. And the truth is, it does not. Separate arrangements need to be made in order for you to be able to donate your brain for neuroscience. Another one is that people believe that bo uh, anatomical body donation is the same thing. It's not. Um, again, separate donate, uh, arrangements need to be made. And the reason for that is um, body donation programs are, are strictly for anatomical purposes. We don't know of any programs that accept body donation for a specific 
illness or a specific disorder. And all the scientists agree that the brain is much more valuable for neuroscience research than the body is for anatomical donation. So um, a, a third one is that some people think only disease brains are needed. That is incorrect. So-called unaffected controls are just as valuable and needed in every single study. Um, and a couple more things. It, brain donation is not disfiguring at all, and that's one of the reasons we have a partnership with the National Funeral Directors Association. And when donating to a brain bank that's affiliated with the NIH, which is, those are the only the ones that we um, support, there is no additional cost to the family to do so. So, um, I learned all this the hard way. Kaylin said you, could, uh, you share your story, but it's kind of such a part of why we're doing this. Um, uh, here's the story of how the Brain Donor Project came to be. We were researching Lewy body's dementia from uh, with which my father had been diagnosed, and brain donation kept coming up. And I think it's because Lewy body's researchers were onto something at the time, and they needed brain donation. Long story short, uh, we were able to donate my dad's brain, but it was terribly complicated and it almost all fell apart, you know, right, right ahead of time. So we talked to a lot of people about what we had done and many of our friends were like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that was a thing. Can you help me do it? And our answer always was, let me see if we can do anything to make it easier um, before and then, then we'll get going on helping other people. So one of the things I, I want you to know right away is that there are two um, major benefits of brain donation. And one of them is, is thanks to this guy. This sounds corny as heck, but there is a powerful sense of comfort that not only did we feel, but I've heard it from so many other families that um, that comes from brain donation. You know, when you're going through a horrible loss, it, it, that it, it does bring a little bit of sense of comfort to know that maybe because of this donation, future families won't have to go through this. And again, it sounds corny, but it's real. Um, and the second reason, and this really illustrates it, is that the family receives a pathology report when you donate a brain to the neurobiobank. Uh, as you may know, many uh, diseases, neuro disorders, especially the neurodegenerative ones, can't be definitively diagnosed until after death with a postmortem examination. So while my dad's doctors suspected Lewy body's dementia, and it was a very well-educated suspicion, um, they didn't know for sure until they conducted the postmortem exam. So I am told that, uh, first of all, these are his histology images enhanced to show something. Um, the dark purple spots on the slide indicate the presence of an alpha synuclein protein that's the hallmark of Lewy body's dementia. So not only is that interesting to know that his doctors were right, but someday when we know more about the genetic underpinnings of many disorders, not just Lewy body's dementia, this information will be important for the family to have. I really feel like we are not that many generations away from being able to um, eradicate or modify certain diseases that we know have genetic underpinnings in a way that they won't be nearly as harmful as they are now. So um, that's the second big benefit of, um, of brain donation. So once we learned all that about my dad, um, we decided to get into uh, the business of supporting science. And so we started the Brain Donor Project with the intense purpose to do two things. One, um, raise awareness of the critical need for people to donate their brains when they die. And the second thing was to simplify the process of becoming that brain donor. So here's how the Brain Donor Project works. We exclusively support the brain banks of the neurobiobank. That is the structure that the NIH calls its system of brain banks around the country. And what they do is they supply neurologic investigators with high quality, well-characterized, which means categorized, donated human brain tissue. 
Um, I've told you what our focus is about, simplifying the process and raising awareness. We do it as by serving as a conduit to the brain banks within the neurobiobank. This illustrates the relationship. We support the neurobiobank exclusively, and they have brain banks around the country, five of them that serve the public and a sixth that just works with the um, medical examiner's office in Pittsburgh. So they are at UCLA, the University of Miami, Mount Sinai and the Bronx, Harvard and the University of Maryland. And I know it seems like there's nothing in the middle, but they can ship um, brain tissue using expedited um, methods all over the country and they have reserved, reserved, they have recovered from even remote Alaska. So the brain banks pride themselves on having a good network of recovery partners and pathologists around the country that they can call upon. So what's interesting about the Neurobiobank is this, it is the nation's only uh, federated network of brain banks. And they got into it because Neuroscientists kept coming to the NIH and saying, we've got a problem. We need to get our hands on donated human brain tissue, and it's very hard to get. And it was hard to get because before this, all the brain banks were housed at um, teaching hospitals or, or medical institutions that sort of felt an ownership of the collection that they had. You know, there were certain disease-based brain banks held at certain places, and there was some barrier, to, some level of barrier to access for that tissue. And the nerd scientists were like, we gotta stop that. We gotta make it easier to get to if we're ever gonna get to the next set of breakthroughs. So the NIH said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna get into the business of brain banking. And so they contracted with those brain banks I just showed you. And their idea was to, um, collect, store, prepare for lab use, and distribute this tissue very efficiently and according to very democratic protocols. So what the Neurobiobank does is it distributes tissue based on the merits of the study period. And there's, you don't have to have an affiliation with an investigator, whoops, I didn't mean to do that yet, with an investigator at a certain institution. You just request it from a you know, a, a, um, a primary investigator or neuroscientist and enter information about the study. And then the scientists get an answer in 24 hours and all they pay is shipping. So it's just a wonderful resource to science. Um, it, the Neurobiobank also accepts and encourages the donation of so-called unaffected control tissue. That tissue is needed in every single experiment. You know, you got to have it for comparative science. So it's it's a very valuable thing. And I'm telling you that so that anybody um, who wants to talk with their family about a great way that people who are who are not affected by a neuro disorder can still support research by donating their unaffected brain. That's it's something that's terribly needed. Um, the Neurobiobank also has stringent transparency and publication requirements. Any, any um, scientist using donated brain tissue has to report the results of their findings through the same portal. And it supports academia as well as industry, meaning pharma can use this tissue as well. And what's not on here is that they also support international science. About 30% of the samples they ship every year are to other countries, which is great because no one has a resource like this. So, um, yeah, we um, we here's here's what we did when we got into the science of supporting science. Um, we decided that we needed to get really serious about it. So here's how you go about beginning the process of becoming a brain donor. Um, you go to braindonorproject.org, which is our website. If you have questions, want to learn more about brain, brain donation, you can um, look all around on the site. There's a very robust FAQ section and a couple places where it walks you through the logistics of this because a lot of people have questions about that and I understand it. When you're ready, um, you complete a brief online form which contains mainly contact info. So it's really, really quick. First question you get asked is, are you doing this on behalf of yourself or someone else? 
The next question is something to the effect of, are we in a hurry? And the rest of it is just contact information for the donor um, and or the family member, if that's the way they're doing it. And then there's room for a diagnosis at the end. Once you've completed and submitted that form, then we take a look at it and we determine which is the best uh, the brain bank that makes the most sense for that particular person. Normally that's based on geography, but there are some other factors, some areas, exclusionary areas for certain brain banks and areas of focus for others. So that comes into play a little bit. Then the brain bank gets in touch or we do. If we're not in a hurry, we go ahead and send the registration forms for that brain bank. If we are in a hurry, then um, we send the phone number for that brain bank. They do some additional vetting questions and then they send the registration forms. But the bottom line is once the family or the donor has completed those forms and sent those back to the brain bank, that's when they become a registered future donor of that brain bank. And it's very important to have that completed uh, before a person would pass because there's a lot of stuff that has to get finished quickly um, upon death and nothing can even get started until the paperwork is in place. So here's how it works upon death and the brain bank supplies all this information as well as a 24 seven phone number to the family. But you'll see from this that it's very incumbent upon the family to see this through. So once you decide um, this is something you want to do and you do the paperwork. It's really critical that you talk with your family about your wishes and you share this information with them. So the brain bank will want to hear from a family member very quickly upon death, like ideally within the hour, if that can be arranged. Then the brain bank arranges to transport the body someplace local. Typically these days, the procedure happens at the family's funeral home. But if for whatever reason that's not doable, they identify another medical or mortuary facility. And then the brain bank sends a pathologist there, a pathologist or a recovery specialist to remove the brain through the back of the head. Again, not disfiguring as I mentioned before. And then he or she ships the brain to the brain bank using special expedited vendors. All of that is at no cost to the family when you're working with a brain bank of the NIH. Then the body is released to the family for funeral or cremation. And this is the part where I always tell families to remember to tell the brain bank that you're going to want a copy of the summary of neuropathological findings. And what that is, is that's the basically the post top line um, post-mortem autopsy results. So it will talk about any diseases discovered in the brain should something develop um, between now and when the person would pass. It'll talk about the stage of the disease and the region or regions of the brain that were impacted. So that's a really um, valuable report for a lot of reasons, especially with in certain circumstances. So just to give you an idea of who's signing up these days, um, we've been around for six years and nearly 16,000 people have at least taken the first steps to become a brain donor, if not, you know, seen it through by now. Um, about um, a third of them are unaffected controls, as I mentioned. They range from prenatal to pretty old. Uh, they come from all 50 states. We've recovered from remote Alaska, so there are uh, haven't really knocked on something, found a place we can't get to yet. And they, um, they, they represent, you know, many, many, many different kinds of neurologic disorders. So mainly we work with a lot of different kinds of patient advocacy groups to help get the word out on this. And we've started encouraging people more and more to share this information with their family and friends so that they can be supportive as well of neuro research, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we also work with a lot of end of life professionals, hospice people, neuroscience nurses, believe it or not, a lot of um, uh, end of life planning people, financial people and will people and whatever who want to know how to do this um, because, you know, we're, we're making the 
argument is you think a lot, we all think a lot when we get close to death about what we're going to do with our stuff, right? We think about what we're going to do with our money and other assets, and it's just as important, if not more so, to consider what you're doing with these very valuable parts of ourselves. So while we work with all these people to try to come up with and get the word out and make sure that people understand how valuable this gift is, every once in a while, we're fortunate enough to uh, make some, uh, you know, make some noise and get some attention on a more broad basis. In uh, October of 2018, so almost four years ago, we were featured in National Geographic magazine, which made for a whole lot of attention. We had more people pre-registering than we had the whole previous year. Um, we were also, I don't know if any of you listen to NPR on Fridays, they do a show called Science Friday, and they featured us in February, and that again led to a big surge. We also co-hosted a briefing of the Congressional Neuroscience Caucus back in March, where Dr. Korshetz, who's the head of the National Institute of Neurologic Disorder and Stroke, and Dr. John Nye, who heads the Brain Initiative, um, they testified about the importance of brain donation, and then there was a House resolution introduced declaring May 7th uh, National Brain Donation um, Awareness Day. So we're, we're trying to make a whole lot of noise about this as much as we can so that the word gets out. Um, oh, this is the graphic they used for Science Friday when I was talking about that. So, you know, we ask everybody to, to think broadly about your legacy and consider brain donation because if you're in a position to contribute to science by gifting things you no longer need um, this makes sense and so please sign up in advance it's very difficult although it can be accomplished but it's very difficult to do this if um, a person hasn't pre-registered also, tell your family about your wishes. They're going to be the ones to see it through. And for more information, we are at braindonorproject.org. So let me see if I can figure out how to stop sharing or else um, Caitlin may have to jump back in and take it away from me because I'm not sure how. So um, are you there, Caitlin? Yes, sorry. Okay. Excellent, excellent. Oh, can you? Okay, good. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know why it's not letting me, so I'm just going to do this. I'm going to become sorry. the presenter. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hey, there we are. Okay, perfect. Oh. It's my camera. All right. Uh, it's <laughs> on. Sorry. Nope, it's coming. Slow today. No, you're great. You're great. You're great. Sorry, I'm not more adept. <laughs> No, I, it's the they updated the system, so it's just taking some getting used to for me too. So, like I said, um, yeah. that was awesome. Thank you so much, Tish. We did have two really good questions come in. Um, I'm gonna ask um, this one first because it's it's actually one of the it's similar to a question that we had before. So I'm gonna kind of maybe lump them together a little bit. Um, a question that came in earlier was. So the, the general um, surgery for Chiari, which I believe you know, is decompression surgery. Sometimes the surgeries can involve reducing the brain tissue. So they'll cauterize it or they'll uh, shrink them a bit, the tonsils of the cerebellum. Mm -hmm. So then there was a second question. It, um, but is this the brain still useful for research after death if it's been physically altered? And then a question that came in just now, which is semi-related, was is there anything that's going to disqualify um, a brain from being donated? Is there such a thing as too much damage and how is something like that measured? That's a very good question. That's a very good question because there used to be a whole lot more decline factors. For example, we didn't, uh, the brain, I say we, but the brain banks of the NIH didn't used to accept brain cancers because it was, there were so many different kinds of tumors and blah, blah, blah. And then scientists discovered they needed to understand more about the effects of radiation. So now, you know, we, we accept a lot of things. Um, the only things they don't really accept are systemic infectious disease, 
Um, and Lyme disease counts, believe it or not, because it behaves like one. But other than that, it's like hepatitis and, and HIV. But if you think about it, COVID is um, often becomes a systemic disease that was infectious and they figured out how to do that, right? So the only other real issues are we can't accept brains from outside of the country because the something called the PMI, the post-mortem interval, which is the amount of time that takes that goes by after um, the person has passed um, or after the brain has been removed, has to be controlled, and that's it. You know, uh, out of the country makes it not doable. Um, what else? Systemic infectious disease, geography. Um, gosh, that's it. That's it. So those are okay. the big things. So to answer your question is, um, any even considering surgery that impacts the brain, those are still things that scientists want to look at. So the first thing they do when they conduct all their things is is validate the they work to verify and validate the diagnoses that have been reported and look for others. And so while a medical records release is signed upon registration, it isn't executed until death so that we know it's complete. And then when they know these things about the person, you know, that they had a Chiari and they had the decompression surgery, they'll be able to learn more from all that stuff. So yeah, anything somebody's been through is very valid information. Awesome. Um, and then I'm going to ask the other question that was semi just before and um, sent, sent in before and just now. Um, there's a question about, can I donate other parts of my central nervous system just in, instead of just brain tissue? So, for example, uh, someone that was talking in the chat, um, they, they would be interested in donating the spinal cord. They have a syringomyelia specifically, so it's strictly in the cord. But there's also questions about CSF, like cerebral spinal yeah. fluid, um, ventricles. What do you think? So CSF is is already a part of it. So they take the brain and CSF, and they take the complete brain. Um, and then as we work with different groups, we learn from the scientists about additional things that may be helpful. And so the Brain banks are open to that, and they've been known to train recovery specialists on how to retain other things. I'll give you an example. I don't know if anybody's heard from about Turner syndrome, but it's more of a metabolic than neurologic disorder. But, but there are um, kidney things that develop and some other things that develop. And so they work with, with specialists to remove other tissues. So if there are things that, that scientists need to know, you know, the other parts that scientists need to have to make it a part of um, the study, then we will work with people to do that. One of the things that we've learned in this process, however, is that a lot of people, a lot of scientists are like, you know what, really, we need the brain. Really, we need the brain. The, the body and some of the other um, parts of the body, well, the body's own, you know, people, a lot of people with, uh, for example, movement disorders will say, take my brain, but then you also need to take these other parts because that's been affected by the disease. They don't do that. Most anatomical donation, we don't know of any anatomical donation that's, that's our whole body donation or body parts donation that's not for just anatomical study. However, that's, you know, again, back to my original point, that if scientists let us know they need other things, then we'll figure out a way to accommodate. That's awesome. Yeah, and especially if um, if CSF fluid is already um, collected, that's kind of what a syrinx is. So it, it would be to, sort of to that. Um, Good. Thing. Yeah. Um, so there's another question. I don't know if you can answer this because it's a little biological. So. Are the different parts of the brain donated differently? So there's like the dura, there's the arachnoid, the pia, um, as far as like within the brain itself. <laughs> okay, so here's the deal. I'm not a scientist. I was a journalist and a public affairs person and a PR person, and I've learned a lot about brain banking and some other things, but I don't know. I will tell you, again, we've had the question a lot about the dura. And so, yes, they routinely take it. Um, if it needs to be preserved, because they don't routinely preserve it, but if it needs to be preserved, that's something that's very easy to do. 
And then the only other thing I can really answer about that is the brain, um, and this really doesn't answer your question, but just so you know, um, the brain is bisected and half frozen and half fixed. That's typically the way they preserve all of it. So I don't know if that plays into the answer that you're looking for. Um, but it's kind of fascinating because different scientists need different things. And the other thing is they still haven't, there's no like shelf life. We haven't figured out what's the expiration date yet for brain tissue. I will tell you that when they started um, experimenting a little bit with brain banking back in the 50s, some of those brains are still being used. Granted, you know, preservation techniques and other tools have advanced a little bit, so they might have some limited usage. But um, yeah, stuff that they've come up with is is really helpful, and we can keep them around. So that's a side. That's actually going to be yeah, that's awesome. That was going to be my follow-up. Um, it's about uh, how are they preserved and stored, and if I was going to add for how long. So yeah, um, yeah. And they're yeah. they're just sitting in the the bio banks in those sites that you pointed out. Yes, correct? and the beauty of that is, you know, people often ask, oh, I want this to go to a Parkinson's brain bank. That's not really how it works with the NIH. You know, they, they go to these brain banks that are in this structure called the neurobiobank. And so when researchers need this tissue, this is amazing to me. This is why I think it's such an unbelievable resource. They go to neurobiobank.nih.gov. If you'd like to check it out, you may. And that's um, so that's their site for the neurobiobank. And when you go there, part of the Part of the site says, oh, you're here because you want to be a brain donor. That's great. We need you really bad. And then it links to us to start the intake process. But for scientists, and I've told young scientists about this, and they're like, oh, my gosh, you know, because when they're ready to, to validate their findings with human tissue, they, they can go in, open a password protected account, enter the details of their study and some information about their credentials, and then consider the supplies half frozen, half fixed, name a disorder, age matched controls. And so they can go in and peruse a lot of preclinical data that exists on the portal about these uh, brains. And then they can select or request specific ones from specific parts. They get an answer within 24 hours and all they pay is shipping. So it's like the most unbelievable resource. Yeah. Great. And actually, that does kind of dovetail into a question that I was going to ask, because I know a lot of people do ask this, is if someone were to donate their brain, is there any way that they can guarantee necessarily that it would be used for Chiari research? But from what you've just said, it does sound like as long as there is a Chiari researcher that is qualified and applying to use the brain bank, then for sure. And yeah. if anything, it would be used for other diseases as well, right? Right. So what we tell people is we can't guarantee what your brain's going to be used for, but we can tell you this. Once you pass and your brain is completely assessed and examined and characterized, that's what it will be listed as. So it only stands to reason that a researcher who's investigating fill in the blank will know that this is the brain of a, you know, X year old man or woman who had this, this and this. And then depending on which areas of the brain are implicated in those diseases, then they make their determination. We've also had people ask us to, um, like if they were donating uh, a control brain, an unaffected control, and they're like, my family member has X disease and I would want my brain to be used for X. Um, I hope everyone understands that we can't do that. And here's why, you know, um, a control brain especially can be used in so many studies that it would be not good stewardship of this precious tissue should we say no 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 we got to put that one aside because we said blah blah scientists drive the decisions and so it's not responsible to do that no I, but i think that's great too because honestly yeah. just by donating once with the goal of donating towards Chiari, you could potentially, maybe your brain has the key to, I don't know, dementia or something. That would be amazing. It would so, be amazing. Yeah. I'm probably going to do that later. But anyway, <laughs> um, I did want to ask a, um, a couple of questions about, you know, family stuff, um, even some legal and even tax stuff. Um, 
but there was one question uh, that I thought was interesting, and you kind of touch on it, but I wonder how specific you can get. Um, can my family access my brain in storage in the unlikely event that it needs to be looked at for familial me medical pur purposes in the future? Oh, that is a very interesting question. Not that I'm aware of. Um, that hasn't come up to my knowledge. Um, and I doubt it just because of just because of the things that need to be done to it to store it properly. You know, but scientists from anywhere can request whatever they need. So if there's a reason that science needs to look at it, that science can take a look. Otherwise, it's not really accessible to anybody else after that. Okay. And, and I guess as a follow-up to that, just thinking about it, if for some reason, this is wild conjecture, so go with me on it. Um, <laughs> if a clinician is working with a patient who might be offspring of someone who'd been donating to, the, who they donated their brain, um, if they were maybe going to write up like a case report or something, are case reports or case studies um, something that the biobank supports or is it strictly uh, like case control studies, different kind of research like that? So any kind of preclinical data that is available on a brain makes it so much more valuable, right? The more we know about any brain, the, the better everybody else is. We are working on ways, because keep in mind that the Neurobiobank was set up to make uh, tissue accessible, right? So nobody can like sit on tissue or say blah, blah, blah. But if someone is does have the preclinical data, because they've worked with a person, that preclinical data is not only attached to that brain in the portal, but we're working on ways that that particular scientist could be notified when the person passes so that they could at least request tissue and get what they need to close the loop on their research. So similarly, if there is a familial situation and you know different members of the family do that, we're working on ways to be able to notify and alert individuals that certain tissue may be of interest to them. I haven't figured it all out, but we're working on ways to do that because, you know, that makes sense that that scientist would have a specific interest in that tissue and we want to help them figure out what they need to figure out. So, yeah, I, I think people forget like how young brain science really is, yeah. the study of neuroscience and all that. Um, yeah. But a really good question just came up based on this conversation, I think. Um, how does HIPAA work with all this? And are these brains de-identified, uh, all of that? And you guys are on it with these questions. Yeah, <laughs> they are de-identified. And it's tricky. Um, the NIH is, is working with this coding system called GUIDS, which is a uh, global unidentified. Uh, do you all know what it is? So, I think it's global unique identifier. You got it. You got it. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, is the answer. We do protect the privacy and the personally identifiable information as well as the medical information that's covered under HIPAA. So it's, um, yes, we, we do all that. We make sure of that. And, you know, the only real communication that's done that, that would um, not really violate that, but go beyond that is what back and forth to brain banks to making sure we have the right thing. But the tissue is de-identified as it is sent to researchers. So That's we're very, very clear on that. The ethicists, the medical ethics people have done some great guidance as you would, I mean, as you would expect, the NIH should be the standard bearer for all these things that are important to all of us to not, um, you know, compromise when it comes to science. So, yeah. Absolutely. I do want to get into some of these legal questions because this is where my expertise is completely gone. Um, <laughs> so, um, what paperwork specifically? I know you work with people going back and forth on this, but is there specific paperwork that's the most important to have done before you know getting through this process so that you can donate your brain after death? Yes, the most important paperwork is to be registered, to be a registered donor of a brain bank. 
The brain bank then will supply the paperwork about what to do at time of death, what is their 24 seven phone number, and they'll encourage you to, well, you have to talk to your family about it because if your family drops the ball, it's not happening. It's not like organ donation where there's a big list and they'll circle back with the family going, oh, your loved one's on the list and they want to be an organ donor. So we're asking you out of courtesy, nobody knows. You know, nobody knows right. this is not a, a list thing. So the most important thing is to be registered as a donor and make sure your family knows your wishes and has the information to see them through. When I was talking previously about end of life planning, you know, attorneys will call and say, so I'm making out their will and what's the wording? And I was like, by the time this will gets considered, it's way too late. Put whatever you want in the will, but it's not going to happen. The thing that your person needs to do is this information and then have that in a folder or a file that they share with one or two people. Um, and that's good enough. You know, that's the best way to see it through. A lot of people are concerned about, do I have to have a wallet card? And while the, while the brain banks do supply those, think about it. You know, if you were to die in an accident, your family, they're not gonna mess with donating your brain. They're gonna mess with trying to save your life. And, and then the next people that would be notified would be your family. So, right. That's that's the thing, but yeah, the paperwork is 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 um, that's those are the important parts. The other thing to know from a legal point of view is um, the family can do this on behalf of a loved one without much paperwork. So it doesn't have to be the POA or the medical POA or the, per the person that has the directives. It can be a family member you know, who starts the process on behalf of someone else and completes it that way. If the person is able, if it, I'm sorry, the donor is able to sign their own name and do any of their own stuff, that's great. If they're not, then there's an, another level of witnessing of signatures that needs to be done. Um, and there is a final consent that's given over the phone upon death from a next of kin. But legally, and this kind of blew me away, legally, the body is considered part of the estate. So it's like once the person is dead, their rights um, to direct these things are pretty limited. So if the family wants to do it and they're in agreement because the brain banks won't get in the middle of a situation where somebody in the family doesn't want it to happen. So if everybody's in agreement, then, you know, you can move forward once the person is gone. When my dad passed, you know, we knew he wanted to be a body donor. Mm -hmm. um, but we didn't, you know, by the time we knew about brain donation, he was not in good enough shape to be able to do his own signing. So we didn't do that, which brings me to another thing. It is possible to be both a brain donor, to donate your brain for neuroscience research at one location and then donate your body for anatomical um, studies okay. and play cells. Yeah, okay. it's, it, it's, it's tricky. Um, Donate your brain first, and that's not just my bias. It's the most important thing. Do that first. And then the trick is to find an anatomical body donation program in your area, because they don't ship bodies around, that will accept a body once the brain has been removed for neuroscience research elsewhere. Some do, some don't. They don't put it on their website. You got to call them and ask them. But if you find a place like that, and we did in northern Cincinnati, it's um, seamless. And then, you know, like I said, we felt really good that so much of my dad has gone to advanced science. That's so. amazing. Yeah. yeah thanks. Um, and this gets to another question um, about the family. What what control would they have after they've passed? Um, I guess I this is going to be more of a have you ever experienced this kind of question then? Um, have you ever experienced the situation where there's a lot of contest contention between the family that are left behind about donating? Yeah, it, as I, um, the brain banks don't want to get in the middle of any of those kinds of situations. So if there is, uh, if they know about, if the brain bank is made aware of for any reason, any family members who are not on board with this, then they, they'll step out of that situation. Mm -hmm. So it's really, that's why it's really important, you know, unless it's an accidental or unexpected death, if you get a chance to talk to your, um, to your people about what you want and why, then it's a whole lot easier for the family to get on board if it's something that they know you want. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is another legal question. Uh, are there any like 
tax implications uh, for the will or an estate if you donate a brain? No, because there's no real um, monetary uh, reward. You know, okay. it's it's funny that you mentioned that because, you know, nobody really sells brains for parts. You know, organ procurement organizations, um, a lot of times if a person is an organ donor but their organs are not viable for transplant, they'll still take long bones and some connective tissue to sell to medical advice medical device manufacturers, you know, to make things. And that's, you know, that's part of how they generate revenue. Nobody's really doing that for brains. And the ethicists would probably be like, yeah, no, we're not going to do that. So yeah, there's the only benefits are the ones I mentioned, which are very um, nebulous. The one about a sense of comfort, that's very nebulous, however real as heck, you know, and then the one about you get some information that report you know, gets some information that can be very valuable to the family, but yeah, no, no others. Um, and then I think you sort of got to this, but if you could speak to it a little bit more um, pointedly, uh, in the case of cremation, how is brain donation specifically handled? Same thing. So a lot of um, crematory places um, or funeral homes that handle cremation, same thing. The body goes somewhere. The um, the pathologist or recovery specialist goes there, removes the brain through the back of the head is standard, whether or not it matters to the family, whether or not there's going to be an open casket. That's just a standard way of doing it um, because it's the most respectful way to do um, what's a tough procedure, you know, and then once the brain is removed and shipped, then the body's released to the family to do whatever they want to do. So yeah, cremation is fine, regular burial is fine. You know, once the brain is removed, the body is the family's to do with what they will. Perfect. Mm -hmm. um, this was, uh, this is a question that came in um, really about, cause you talk about all the stuff that the biobank and that the brain donor project are doing. Do you, do you know how big the staff are at the, the biobank and at brain donor project, which are two different things? Um, well, the staff at the Brain Donor Project is currently an all-volunteer staff. However, we just received some NIH funding that will enable us to scale. I know we're really excited. Um, and we have been supported by some various gen very generous donors up to now that have enabled us to get a lot done on very little. So, But we're about to scale. The brain banks, it kind of depends since most of them are at um, you know, one's at Harvard and it's at McLean Hospital. And so they employ a lot of different kinds of people just to give you an idea. There are many kinds of coordinators that work with the families to help them understand what's going on, supply the right paperwork, make sure they have the consents in place. And then there are some coordinators who handle all the logistics. They keep the um, network of recovery specialists and pathologists current and put people on standby where they think they know they might have imminent situations. And then there's all the scientists, you know, there's all kinds of pathologists, neuroscientists who do many different kinds of um, assessments of the brain. They also send out for certain toxicology testing and other things that require vendors participation. So, they're significant, it, which goes to another point I should be making, is, and that is that there are significant costs associated with brain banking. You know, it's a very expensive infrastructure to start with because the freezers are expensive. Um, you have to have like some significant kinds of generators. Should there be a power failure? Can you imagine? You can't let all that stuff, you know, be handled any other way. Right, right, right. So it's very expensive. And for that reason, you know, there, there may be a time that comes when, you know, we have an overabundance of certain kinds of tissue and we have to ask the scientists to say, what are the most valuable kinds of these cases that you want? And we will help you um, through the through delivering questionnaires to certain um, patients to make sure they fit 
because you know we're, we're approaching that right now with some neurodegenerative diseases you know the dementias and the alzheimer's are so pervasive that um we could bring we could bank only that and not have room for other things so yeah. you know it, it, it it's just a interesting thing to note that you know the the resources that are available for brain banking are not infinite like they are not for anything else you know so at some point some tough decisions may have to be made about what is acceptable and what's not yeah that's a actually that's a really good plug to maybe get some brains with Chiari in there as yeah. soon as possible. <laughs> yeah. um, that yeah, actually we do have, we do have some I, I, I kind of monitor what people report mm -hmm. and um, you know there are there are a few that people have mentioned I have no idea how old these I'd have to look to get specifics but we have some we have some awesome. my mom has one. Oh my gosh she didn't <laughs> She didn't know yeah. until she developed arthritis of the cervical spine, and they're like, oh, by the way, I, I imagine that happens to a lot of people that have kind of innocuous ones. You yeah, know? absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's more common. Actually, that's kind of validating because that would help in the future to, you know, compare symptomatic versus non-symptomatic. And actually, right. that kind of gets to, like, this follow-up question that I do want to ask. You talk about they do, like, this intake stuff. Um, do they get data on, obviously they get data on like the clinical diagnoses, but do they do stuff on like lifestyle, demographics? Um, that? They do, they do. And they do more and more of that. Obviously the the biomarkers are the more uh, critical information they get up front, but in certain, they are collecting information about a lot of lifestyle habits. And think about this too. Severe mental illness is a giant category, you know, in brain banking, and especially with some of the ones that are limit people tremendously, like schizophrenia. So, in addition to having the tissue and inspecting the tissue and doing all the things that they do, they do interviews with the family, and they want to talk about behaviors and all those all those sort of things. I did a I, I do a podcast occasionally for this veteran support group, and one of the things that um, especially with blast injuries, because it's a different kind of brain injury that creates a different kind of scar tissue. And, and what scientists really want to know is at what point after the blast do certain symptoms, behavioral or psychiatric or whatever, appear. Oh, wow. And so they were they were going to ask, you know, these service members um, to initially journal and the, and the one man I was talking to was like, yeah, you know, when you get a bunch of vets to talk right about your feelings, that's yeah. not going to happen. So what they did was get these field log books and mm -hmm. you know, uh, service members are very familiar with filling out a field log, you know. And so if it, it, the addition, the inclusion of something like that with the preclinical data is very valuable. So yeah, they're they're trying to they're finding all kinds of new ways to capture, um, you know, sort of ancillary information about brains, but it really is an ancillary. It can be just as important. So yeah, very good question. Yeah, and I guess um, now this is a question just for you because you're kind of involved in it. I wonder, are there certain types of people that are more willing to donate their brain after death? Um, are there specific populations, I guess is what I'm getting at, that you wish would get more engaged in this kind of donation? Yeah, very well put, and yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's no secret that underserved communities in society are also underrepresented in science, right? Um, and there are reasons for that that are legit. There's a lack of trust, um, you know, and that's and some cultural things are you know, speed bumps at a minimum, right? So yeah, we we need to do a better job of engaging communities because if the science isn't representative of everybody, then the science is incomplete, period. Mm -hmm. And so we're we're all learning. We're all learning that we need to do more and trying to learn what more looks like and how we can make it so it's not really just such a transactional thing um, in a way to create trust or in some cases which is harder restore trust so that is a very big deal and it is a big 
challenge. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I feel very strongly about all that. So, yeah. Um, a question that came to my mind while we were doing this, and I'll, I'll put a last call for questions because we're coming up on the 830. Um, but I was curious, do you ever notice that the biobank isn't able to um, provide enough brain tissue for the researchers that are inquiring for them to finish their studies? So is there ever a situation where they, they've run out of, they still need a certain number of participants in order to you know, complete their analysis? Does that ever happen? Well, they take what they can get, you know? And so the answer is, sample size might not be optimal and that's what you're sacrificing to get the tissue so yeah. you know, it's funny when, when we started working on this um the guy who was the head of the national institute um for mental health always um challenged his staff to consider what will happen if we're too successful you know what if what if we start doing this and everybody's like oh yeah we all you know and so we're overwhelmed and, and the answer to that was, that's not going to happen in our lifetime or the next two generations at a minimum, because there's no substitute for this. There's no substitute for this. And while technology keeps advancing in such a way that we have all these fancy cameras to do all the imaging and blah, 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 where are they going to point them if they don't understand enough of what's going on in the brain to understand, you know, where that goes that's a problem the other thing is um there are some tools that they come up with and you know again i'm not a scientist so they they tell me enough to be able to explain it but there's some tools that they come up with that if the if the pmi which is the post-mortem interval so if the amount of time between when um a, a brain is recovered and gets to the brain bank is really short you know, if it's really brief, like 12 hours instead of the 24 hour hard deadline, that there are some tools that can really extract a whole lot more viable, valuable information. So we're doing some pilot projects, you know, in areas where we limit the catchment area to very close by, you know, right. it's, if those brains are recoverable quickly and back at the brain bank quickly, they can find out a lot more information. So, you know, as technology advances, there's going to be different ways to to really make science, um, you know, yeah. make it better, make it better. I think that's that's probably what's so exciting about it for me. We actually, someone just said in the chat that they they got really excited about this. They're going to get free registered and get the ball rolling. But I think yeah. what I think is exciting about this is like you can donate your brain after your death and you have no idea a where science will be at that point and b where it'll go so the fact that it has a very long shelf life i mean it that's amazing that you could even impact the world like that caitlin that smacks me in the face every day it really does yeah. so i completely understand what you're saying. it's amazing it's amazing um, there's just one last question that I did want to address, and I don't know if you're necessarily going to be able to answer it, um, but if someone does donate their brain, uh, would their family be able to learn what that donation was helpful in studying? So is there any way to like maybe track what research results were published uh, via the brain biobank? Um, is that, am I saying this right? <laughs> the biobank uh, yeah. sample? So specifically, no, but generally, yes, in a good way, because when I mentioned the part about how scientists are required to publish their findings if their studies used, and so where they publish them is on the NeuroBioBank website, and there's a okay. pretty substantial um, you know, list of all this stuff, and so they sort it by disease group and they sort it by author and all these different ways. But if, you know, if you're donating, donating the brain of a loved one who had, for example, Parkinson's, that's a big category. And you go in there and you see what they're finding so far, you get an idea of where we're headed and what has been done to advance the science of that particular disease. So, and then you get the neuropath report, but since one brain can be used for so many different things, that's a, that's uh, an area of monitoring that doesn't get a lot of attention right now because they just can't keep track of all of it that way. I'm 
that's good, I think. <laughs> so, yeah, people our, are yeah. Um, yeah. So all those papers are listed on their their website at, at NIH, right? Yeah, at neuro, um, neurobiobank.nih.gov is where okay. you can go. Um, yeah. Um, yeah research a little bit about what has been found with by using donated brain tissue and then this is my nerdy question just because now i'm interested uh, <laughs> so because it's being supported in a sense by the nih are those papers free free to access because yeah. i know that happens a lot of the time they are that's amazing yeah, they are and you know what i love that that's happening so much in science right now the silos really are um you know coming down it's like yeah you know, it, um, people can't be as proprietary about their findings as they once were because it slows down progress. And I think they're, most people are understanding that. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I love it. <laughs> but well, thank you so much, Tish, for doing this with us and everyone for joining um, and everyone that's going to watch later. Um, if anyone would want to get in touch with you, uh, do you have like a contact on the website or how, yeah, how do people get? We do. Info at braindonorproject.org is the best way to get in touch with us and, and get whatever you need. I invite people to look around on the website, too. There's a, a lot of good information there. And then, obviously, that's where you'd register at braindonorproject.org. Upper right-hand corner, there's a little brain pre-registration button, and that's where you go to start the process. Thanks for asking. Awesome. Well, thank you, and thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, you. Uh, yeah, that, someone's asking me to put this in the chat, so I will also put it in the chat before everyone leaves. <laughs> Great. Uh, Runnerproject.org, correct? Yep. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank Wish you. you all the best. Bye.